You are watching NCN. for development notwithstanding those overarching themes this afternoon's topic will zero in on a specific subject matter one that perhaps has had or has benefited from a very good lead-up based on today's discussion both of the earlier panels uh, touched on issues that I believe will be best addressed from this panel. And so the topic for this panel is the rise of the citizen reporter and social media influencer. And we're gonna look at trends for 2022 and beyond of course, within the social media landscape. Allow me to introduce our distinguished lineup of panelists, beginning with uh, from the extreme right of the table, Ms. Stacy DeSantis Rahman. Ms. Rahman is the co-owner of a full-service marketing agency, Krista Marketing Solutions. She's also the co-founder of the four-time award-winning travel and tourism brand, Visit Guyana. Many of you would have seen her posts from across the country, illuminating tourism in Guyana like has never been seen before. Stacey is also the co-founder and publisher of the award-winning Visit Guyana Travel Magazine and the director on the board of directors of the Guyana Tourism Authority. Apart from her professional portfolio, she's a mom of two. She's a firm believer in youth empowerment, promoting entrepreneurial culture and small business development. She uses her platform to regularly promote and mentor Guyanese startup brands and businesses. Stacy Rohaman de Santos, uh, de Santos Rohaman, sorry. To her left is Mr. Ruel Johnson. Ruel is a creative writer, journalist, and policy expert with senior editorial experience in both state and private media in Guyana and overseas. He is the recipient of fellowships and awards from Interilia, the U.S. State Department, the Cropper Foundation, Commonwealth Writers, the Ghana Prize for Literature, and the Prince Claus Fund. He is currently working as a technical officer on culture within the Ministry of Culture, culture Youth and Sports, Mr. Ruel Johnson. I'm going to skip the middle panelists because uh, our panelist at the center is quite unconventional in his approach to everything that he does. And so he is not uh, very open to these kinds of accolades. And so I will let him introduce himself at the end. Uh, so I'm going to go over to the person to his left, who is Mr. O.C. Rogers a social influencer broadcaster uh, for many years in Guyana here and now in the United States. Mr. Rogers has been a radio broadcaster and TV talk show host for many years, as I just mentioned. His voice was a staple for Guyanese as he hosted many radio programs, both on state and private stations. He's currently working in New York, uh, hosting the Indo-Caribbean show, which could be heard on AM 620 WSNR every Saturday from 12 to 3 p.m. in New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. Mr. O.C. Rogers. Uh, 
Mr. Ron Tony is the guy at the end with that lovely flan suit. He hails from Linda, and I take particular pride in mentioning that because I too hail from Linda. Many of the leading journalists and broadcasters in our landscape today, you would recognize hail from Linda, Mr. Gordon Mosley and others. And so it's a pleasure to introduce Mr. Raul Tony uh, to this panel. He joined the media in 2004 as a sports journalist at NCN in London and would later transition to NCN in Georgetown. He currently works for both NCN and the Guyana Chronicle. Uh, he has served a few years with Starbuck News and is a former sports editor at the newsroom. Raul is an executive member of the Ghana Press Association, and so he's here in that particular capacity representing the GPA. He's currently uh, a radio show host on 94.1 FM, while also hosting a series of other television sports shows and anchoring the NCN News and he has been doing that for some time now. He is a social influencer with a following of almost 20,000 and is a social uh, brands ambassador for several corporate entities, notably among them, the Ghana Lottery Company, Mr. Raul Tony. And now I return to our special guest on the panel known to all of us as the Guyanese critic. His name is Mikhail Rodriguez. And just before I allow him to tell you about himself, let me tell you what I've heard from him and all of us would have heard that he's the realest thing coming out of Guyana since sliced bread. So there you go, Mr. Mr. Rodriguez. Kindly tell us about yourself. Press the mic. Yes. Oh, thank you. Uh, all protocols observed. Um, I feel honored to have this opportunity. Um, in light of the fact of how hard it has been and how trying it has been for me to come here, um, most persons do not know. Uh, of me in a, in, a, in a formal setting and know that I can be rough around the edges and can be very harsh and stand up for what I believe in. Um, just so you know, there is a method to the madness. And I would not have been here today if it was not for a lacking that I observed in um, the media, so to speak. Outside of that, um, I must say I love what I do. And my heart is very much in this. And my intention is to leave something with the people, the citizens of my country that could be remembered for a long time to come. I'm hoping that I impact, I'm hoping, I say, that I impact in a positive manner as much as the pushback that comes sometimes come as a result of persons in society, persons in media, seeing um, what I do as against the norms. My intentions are the best. And I don't think I have to, you know, keep saying that because of the fact that unlike many people who have come and been a part of the media and have worked very hard, I have shown what my capabilities are and I have a list, a long list of things that I would, done, would have done as a result of my work. Thank you very much, Mr. Rodriguez. 
Allow me before we get into the introductory remarks from our panelists to recognize two of the stalwarts, two of the veterans of the Guyanese media landscape that I noticed here today. Um, there might be many others who were among us, but I noticed today the presence of Mr. Visham Ramsewak. Many of the older ones among us would know of that name, a staple in the Guyanese radio landscape for years, as well as Miss Miranda LaRose. I don't know if they're still with us, but I wish to acknowledge their presence and ask you to kindly greet them nicely. So I'm gonna now invite the panelists to use five minutes each uh, to give us an overview of your perspective of the topic, the rise of the citizen reporter and the social influencer and the trends that we are seeing and can continue to see this year and beyond, starting with Ms. Rohaman De Santos. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, all protocols being observed. Um, I just want to say to the organizers, thank you so much for having me. I'm quite honored to be here. So um, as Daria would have mentioned, we've heard over the last two days, several persons making mention of social media being an intricate part of media's changing landscape. And this is quite true. And as somebody who not only has a social media influential page, but somebody who has managed social media pages, I have seen these changes and I see the impact that they have had. So it brings me great pleasure to be able to say something and share um, my advice and as well as my insight into the topic today. In today's world, access to information is easier than ever. With a mobile phone, it's literally in the palm of our hands. I mean literally. This ease of creating and disseminating information has given rise to the buzzword influencers. However, today what I want to do is sort of explain that there are different headings on the which persons can be placed and considered an influencer. There are social media influencers, which is the subject of our, top, uh, our topic, they're citizen reporters, another type of influencer. They're TV hosts, celebrity influencers, basically people who may have influence but are not necessarily social media influencers. So what I'll do is try to explain the difference. What exactly is a social media influencer? Most times armed with just a mobile phone, a social media influence is a person who have amassed a large audience of followers. But what sets them apart is their ability to influence an action from this audience. And most times social media influencers, they work with brands. Their interest is in selling creating awareness of or promoting a particular brand. So that's what a social media influencer is. And their objective most times is to create a sale or to sell an item. They have amassed this credibility because they become household names. The people who follow them have grown to trust them. They know them on a first name basis without even meeting them in person. Right, so I can attest to this. People call me by my first name when they meet me, they hug me, they come, they take photos. They're, they're a part of a community. In fact, on Visit Ghana, we call them our Visit Ghana fam, our Visit Ghana family, because we ourselves take them into consideration where we are creating content. Everything that we do on our page, we keep them in mind. Are they going to learn something from this? Is it gonna have an impact on them? Will it help them to make a decision? Will it have a positive impact? So all of these things help us to get to know our audience and connect with them. 
And that is what a social media influencer is. The most successful social media influencers are considered experts in their niche. And that's another point about a social media influencer. They're usually very niche. So they're travel influencers, they're fashion influencers, makeup influencers. That's why they work with brands. And they have basically revolutionized the way brands view marketing strategies. Now, citizen reporters. Again, smartphones have enabled regular citizens to report breaking news as it happens. But the interest of a citizen reporter is different from a social media influencer. The interest of a political commentator is different from a social media influencer. While all of them may have influence, their interest is not necessarily in selling a product or endorsing a product. So that's the difference. While immediate coverage at the hands of citizen reporters has advantages, it also, however, comes with disadvantages. And I guess in this panel, we'll examine some of those. As some of them may not be tied to things like code of ethics, and therefore don't feel the need to be held accountable for anything that they put out there. And some of them may not be motivated to dig deeper to find out more about the story. So they're just showcasing the story as it happens, but not delving into the background, as somebody pointed out in an earlier panel. Influencers and citizen reporters, however, both of them are now competing with traditional media for social media real estate. And I'll tell you, they're winning the battle. So these individuals are now doing work and getting the reach and the likes and the attention that full, fully staffed media houses have not been able to hone using traditional media. So I'll just delve straight into some of the trends, social media influencer trends. One of these trends is that social media, sorry, brands are now actually adding social media marketing and social media influencer marketing into their social media budgets. They're budgeting to work with influencers now, and that will only continue. So that's one of the trends. Another trend is persons are working now with influencers who have a presence on multiple social networks. And the reason for this is you can reach different demographics on different networks. So for example, TikTok, you might reach a certain demographic there. You're, they're consuming content differently because it's video intensive as opposed to Facebook, which is more lives and more images. So now brands, even traditional media, are now looking to work with influencers who are on multiple networks to tap in to multiple demographics. So that's another trend that will continue. Another trend is the movement, and I mentioned this just now, from text and images to more audio and video content, and we've seen this from Instagram Reels, TikTok videos, more people are resonating towards this type of short form video content because of the way that this new millennial generation, they're getting accustomed to consuming content in this short form. So that's another trend. Another one is that um, brands are looking now for long-term collaborations with influencers rather than short term. And again, this has to do with credibility. So credibility, and again, I'm sure that's something we're going to discuss, is another trait of a, a social media influencer that meet traditional media houses, brands, and other uh, business people are looking for, they're looking for credibility. So all of that falls within the realm of us discussing as a citizen journalist and a social media influence, I just pick up my phone and start to create content and I get, I go viral and get a million followers. How, how am I held accountable if I put out news that is not, or information that is not fact checked? So things like that we have to look at. So um, again, one phrase we've worked continuously over the last two days is with great power comes great responsibility. And as influencers, we must never forget that just because we have a following, 
We should abuse that following. We should always act in a responsible way. And our platforms should be used to educate, to inform, to inspire, and to impact positive change. So that's my two cents um, on the topic so far. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Stacy, for that schooling on the structures to the whole sphere of, of social media. Uh, many of us follow social media, we participate, but in terms of recognizing uh, how it's categorized and structures with it, structured within within um, sort of a professional uh, grouping as it relates to other media. It's, it's, it's great to hear that perspective. Mr. Ruel Johnson. Hi. Hi, good afternoon. Yeah. As with Stacey, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me here. Um, this morning was, a, I think, a good example of the, the usefulness of something like this, in that you saw, I think, was necessary in any viable media environment, which is a contestation of ideas, particularly between the private media and um, the state media. And I think the state apparatus should be given um, some gratitude, no recognition at least, for building the table and bringing everybody to it. Um, now this, this concept of citizen reporter and social media influence influencer um, is something that they've had a long-held uh, personal academic uh, interest in, as well as, I think more importantly, some have inconsiderable experience both as um, somebody who has worked in senior capacity in the mainstream media, as well as somebody who has been involved in what can be termed citizen reporting, allegedly. Um, now, to give a bit of background on the concept of the citizen reporter, this is a fairly new thing that has happened um, over the past 20 years, beginning about 20 years ago in South Korea. Um, in response to what one uh, person felt, one guy felt that was a consolidation of media control in the hands of a few. And over time, what he did was he, he um, created an online a website that he asked people to contribute news to. And over time, he grew from a couple hundred people in South Korea to about 100 countries and about 20,000 contributors. Um, that spread. I see, and it, it was it was a confluence of two things: one, the increasing consolidation of media ownership into a few hands, both in South Korea and globally, and the rise of the internet and increasing control over what who could publish what on the internet um, that made the citizen reporter possible. Um, the other component of this is the, is the term influence, and of course, Stacey is the expert in that. She gave a, a, a good, she, she sort of took a lot of the explanation about the difference that I was going to explain. So a social media influencer essentially is somebody who has a commercial interest in um, using, the, using the internet to provide information as opposed to, say, a journalistic intent. Now, there's some people who sort of straddle the divide and, and, and avoid definition. I could use, um, for example, somebody like um, my good friend, Melissa Melimel Atwell, who is, doesn't, doesn't pretend to be a journalist, has a social media following, an influence, but also does not significantly, significantly endorse any product or service and is more and more involved in what we call social media advocacy. Um, so there's that, that sort of gray area that, that shows up. Um, over the past couple of years, um, I would say the, about 10 years ago, there was something called the Arab Spring. 
that in which there was a plateau of what you call um, citizen reporting, in which countries, people, citizens in countries in North Africa and the Middle East rose up um, to overthrow what were seen as oppressive regimes and they um, used social media to disseminate information in areas and situations in which mainstream media could not. And that was sold as an example of the best use of social, um, of the citizen reporter using the available technology to get credible news and information in, in opposition. Now, when you, when you speak about the, the rise of the citizen reporter and the social media influencer, it sounds like, it sounds like this epic thing wherein you're discovering some, some heroic journey. But see, rise presumes two things. One, an ascendancy from a position of low status to high status. But it also implies a toppling of a hegemony, of a pre-established order. And that is the framework in which citizen journalism and social media influence, particularly in terms of advocacy, um, has been coached. But the reality is not that simple. Um, the, the, the present, this is called the media. And the, what's important, people sort of put into the background, is the medium. Now, citizen reporters are not using their own platforms to get the message out. The same citizen reporters that, or the concept of citizen reporting that started as a, an opposition to the hegemony of consolidated media and business interests now find themselves um, beholden and dependent on those very interests. For example, in the Arab Spring, Twitter and Facebook are owned by billionaires. And what was seen as a, a spontaneous grassroots revolution was not so much that as the consolidation of a political agenda in which, a geopolitical agenda in which the users of Facebook and Twitter in these countries were merely conduits of an agenda and not originators of viable, credible information. And how we know that is true is that at the same time that the Arab Spring was in, in foment, you had the CIA and USA um, creating something called Zoom Zunio in Cuba, which was hailed as, a, which was meant to be sort of a Cuban version of Twitter and in which they were testing anti-Castro, anti-regime messages. And eventually it flopped. But that, that shows the, the power of powerful agendas to um, inform what purports to be, or what is sold as citizen journalism. And of course, in 2016, you had the sort of reversal of that when Russia influenced um, through a very complex network of social media bots, legitimate news organizations, gra supposedly grassroots organizations, the outcome of the US um, elections in 2016. Um, this brings us to the, to, and this is, this is the sort of point of departure from which I hope we can have a discussion. So in the, in the, the, the rise of the citizen reporter, was in the spirit of a concept called, a French concept called the trahison de clerc, which means the treason of clerks, in the sense that the people, the intellectuals, the artists, the journalists, essentially, and this came from the about a century and a half ago, but essentially the, the, in 20 years ago, the, the concept was the same. These people who were responsible for guidance, for truth, for the arbitration of ethical presentation of information to people, 
they had betrayed those people. They committed treason, right? The clerk in this in the, in the in treason, the clerk means artist, journalist, intellectuals. Now, if we're saying that every citizen, every citoyen, is a clerk, every citizen is, a, is, a, is, a, is an artist, an arbiter of taste, an arbiter of ethics, a journalist. But we still have, in this age, I think the greatest misinformation, greatest, greatest influx of misinformation into the public domain, then you essentially have the same thing, this trizone, but this time, this citoyen, in the sense that the very citizens that are not, have now taken up the mantle of journalism in response to these vested interests are now involved both consciously and unconsciously, in the betrayal of the very thing that they set out to correct. Um, so it's a complex thing. Why one, and, the, and it comes to what the, the theme of this World Press Freedom Day thing, it's, it, it's, um, it's journalism on the digital siege. Now a siege requires two things requires a protected space occupied by ostensibly good interests being attacked by ostensibly bad interests. Now, if it is that citizens are journalists protecting supposedly good interests, where is the attack coming from and by whom? Um, so, as we open up the floor, I'd like to lead the or encourage the audience into discussion of those concepts including the the recent acquisition of twitter by um elon musk which, which raises questions about the corporate influence on the citizen reporting citizen journalists etc thank you thank you all quite quite a lot of thought-provoking information there. And I'm sure many of you are now grappling with in terms of how you would like to question or interrogate uh, that information and, um, and the kind of recommendations you might want to make in response to many of those, uh, those issues that have arisen from the contextualization of social media as put by Ruel. Uh, would you like to pass or go now, sir? Uh, Mr. Rogers. Thank you very much, uh, Dario. And um, I want to remind you that we went to nursery school together and I, I'm from London also. <laughs> All right, um, Honorable Minister of Home Affairs and Information, Mr. Wilfred Abraham, our special invitees, fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen. It's indeed an honor for me to share this stage with these distinguished gentlemen and the lady um, as we continue today to celebrate World Press Freedom Day. Our task here on this panel is to discuss the rise of social, the rise of citizens, reporters, and social media influencers, and to examine the trend for 2022 and beyond. It is my humble opinion that live stream, uh, that like mainstream media, social media influencers and citizens reporters has played and will continue to play a gatekeeping like role in disseminating information and current affairs activities. While social media influencers style of bringing information to the public can be described as a departure from journali journalism correctness. I am led to believe that the consumers of this style of reporting would prefer to focus on the information being delivered rather than who is delivering it. More like, let us focus on the message and not the messenger. Let us not forget the role social, uh, the role social media influencers and citizen reporters played both here and in the diaspora in fighting off the enemies of democracy who attempted to rig the 2020 general election 
and destroy the democratic gains made by the current government prior to 2015. My friends, the rise of social media can be considered a blessing and also a cause for concern at the same time. Not all social media influencers are equal. Many countries around the world are seeing an increase, an increased threat to their democracies as social media is used to spread disinformation and outrageous fake news. In the United States, where I reside, we have seen the biggest threat yet to its democracy in the 2020 presidential election and the immediate aftermath leading all the way to January 6th attack on the US Capitol. And here in Guyana, our people continue to face an onslaught of half-truths, race baiting, intimidation, character assassination, and downward lies and fake news peddled on social media mainly by, and this is my opinion, ladies and gentlemen, mainly by social media influencers attached to the main opposition party in this country. I believe this is done to keep an otherwise irrelevant political party relevant. Finally, I am of the firm belief that the free-for-all social media platforms would need more policing so as to safeguard against unscrupulous influencers who sometimes pose a threat to democracy and even life, as was the case with the misleading information regarding COVID and the vaccines. With this, I'm looking forward to this discussion, and thank you very much. Wondering if it's now necessary to belatedly add a disclaimer to the views. Thank you very much, OC and we appreciate uh, the input. Blame the gray hair on my head for forgetting that we are both from London. Mr. Raul, Tony, uh, could you give an overview from your perspective of the topic at hand? All right, good day, everyone. Our protocols observe. Today, I sit here as a representative of the Guyana Press Association. Before I start, though, let me say uh, thanks to Dario. Uh, 2004, I can't remember what month it was, but <laughs> Dario was looking for someone to work along with Lennox Gaspar in sport, at a sports show in Linden. And he had asked for recommendations and for persons to apply. Back then, all I was was just a regular national basketball player and someone who commentates on the sideline of every single thing that I was doing along with my friends. So I walked through the door, got a job, and I, I must say, everything that I learned in journalism across the board, I learned from Dario, learned how to read, learned how to write the script, learned how to anchor the news to Dario, so thanks for that. Um, as I mentioned, I'm here as a representative of the Guyana Press Association, and. An interesting topic, the rise of citizens reporters and social media influence, influencers trends for 2022 and beyond. Ironically, I represent both the conventional and conventional media and also social media influencers. Uh, the latter is something that I just happened to fall upon based on what I do in forms of conventional reporting. But the Guyana Press Association, particularly in its constitution, let me get this right, particularly in its constitution under the heading Declaration of Principles and the Conduct of Journalism, and it states that the International Declaration is proclaimed as a standard of professional conduct for journalists engaged in the gathering, presenting, disseminating, and commenting on news and information, and in describing news events as respect for the truth, and for the right of the public to truth in the first duty of the journalist, that should be, is the first duty of the journalist, in pursuance of this duty, he or she will defend the twin principles of freedom in the honest collection and the publication of news and the right of comment and criticism. The journalist reports only in accordance with the facts of which he or she knows the origin he or she will not suppress essential information or falsify documents. He or she will use only fair methods to obtain news, photographs, and documents. 
and any publication, any publishing information rather, which is found to be harmful or inaccurate, he or she will do their utmost to rectify. I listed those comments from within the Guyana Press Association constitution, which was there before many of us that are sitting in the room. In fact, the, the, the drafters of those constitution, of that constitution, most of them are not here. So many of us that would have been in the, in the field of journalism, regardless of which aspect of journalism, are guided by these principles. Today, the Guyana Press Association would have taken umbrage to a number of things where, with regards to the legitimacy or legitimizing that social media influencers or citizen journalists as legitimate journalists. The Guyana Press Association on many accounts would have placed on record their dissatisfaction where legitimate media houses are being disenfranchised in terms of having the right and their access to state officials with regards to pertinent information and issues that arise within our country, be it our questioning on a number of topics that are important to the citizens. And you would find that legitimate media houses are being sidelined as opposed to having a citizen journalist or one would be terming a social media influencer having that right to a sit down and having that information. While we accept and applaud the information being disseminated by the state, the Guyana Press Association would have on many accounts again placed on record the fact that legitimate journalists with legitimate concerns across various media houses are being deprived of that same treatment. So this is a very interesting topic. And if you notice, many of the questions posed to the panelists throughout the two days centered right back to social media and social media influences and their role in democracy, as O.C. would have pointed out in a very political way, and also their role in getting information now. Now, I'm certain a number of, media, a number of journalists like myself would have some concerns with what I would determine, again, this is in my opinion, a disclaimer, pop-up journalists and pop-up media houses taking information that you would have worked tirelessly putting together, finding all the facts, finding all the background information, and they take that from your media or wherever you share it and share it to their media houses or so online, or I should say, Facebook page or social media account without giving one credit to the source of their information or taking your information, putting it and manipulating the narrative of your work. That's an area of concern for the Guyana Press Association as well. So I don't want to be too long because uh, most of the panelists here would have touched on some of the things that I want to address and I guess that is the disadvantage of being last. <laughs> Uh, but nonetheless, I look forward to some of the questions that are posed, and uh, I look forward to the engagement. Thank you very much, Mr. Tony. Mr. Rodriguez, would you like to give an overview? Thank you. Thanks once again. Um, firstly, I want to start off with uh, the Ghana Press Association's constitution which seemingly um, constitutions have now become something that people hide behind. Like uh, the now opposition when they were in government continued to misuse and abuse the constitution. Um, I must say, again, I look at, I follow Raul, um, although we got We've had in our past a bit of bad blood between us. I follow all. I think he's an exceptional sports journalist. But since we're here and in the topic, and you guys might know, I do not go outside of my personal experiences. 
Rawl himself failed to recognize the constitution of the Guyana Press Association when he came in front of my house and protested, blatantly lying on me. So let's not go too far. Again, I respect him as a journalist, um, as a sports journalist, an amazing sports journalist, and I follow him. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have normally tell him as Fali, but as Fali, he has given me sports news from. Um, so that being said, I want to make it clear the importance of the citizen journalist and the social media influencer. Today, you would not be afforded the opportunity to be a part of this if it wasn't for the ability of every individual to take their phones or whatever social platform afforded to them and express how they felt about the attempts of a government blatantly trying to rig an election. So let's not look at the Constitution because of the Guyana Press Association because they themselves were not looking at it. The Constitution of the Guyana Press Association and the Guyana Press Association existed also for 28 years while elections were rigged continuously. The reason we are here today at this forum afforded the opportunity to have this discussion is because of the citizen reporter. It is because everybody now has the opportunity. And the citizen reporter exists mainly because the press association and its associates have failed to bring the truth in a timely fashion to the citizen, the social media influencer. I can tell you, before I started Facebook Lives, I saw the need for the truth. I saw the need for every story to come to light. And hence I decided all that I would do would be via Facebook Live. And what is the reason for that? Not to attack academia, but I am a high school dropout, and I have made it here, right? I've done well for myself, and I continue to strive to do the best for my country. But I chose live streaming so in what I do, and it happens a lot of times, for those who follow me would know, I would say I'm in this village and somebody said, no critic, that is not the village. So that's why I choose live. Because in my mind, in the constitution that I have created and, and the laws that I've created to guide myself, because of the influence I've had, I, I have, I have chose to be transparent firstly with the news, because people will have the opportunity now even to say in the comments, critic, you're mistaken. No, it's not so. And we could have an open discussion. So it is very unfortunate that it seems constitutions have become things to, be, to hide behind. Because while we speak about social media influencers, try to categorize them, try to bring them down from where they are, what they are some negatives. They are some persons that use their influence in a negative fashion. But these conventional media houses are also disseminating misinformation on social media. We're using the same platforms influencers are using, the citizen reporters are using. So to give respect to the citizen reporter, it must be recognized that they would not have existed. Who wants, do you know how hard is it for someone to go in front of the screen and say, in front of a, a camera? A lot of people are camera shy, but people are driven to that. Do you see stories in the newspapers about bad roads? What are the stories you see? Conventional media has been taken over by big business. 
It is the citizen reporter who has to now come and say, we're having bad roads. This is the situation. This is the shortcoming. Unfortunately, the constitution of the Ghana Press Association has not been able to metamorphosize into what is needed in the 21st century. That's all I have to say. Thank We're you very much, Mr. Rodriguez. Um, I believe you may agree with me that the contributions, the, the, the uh, perspectives offered by our panelists has set up a stage for very robust discussion among us this afternoon. And so let me now set the stage for the first round of questioning, uh, looking at the various elements contained in the presentations we've just heard. And so I wanna start with a question to an audience member or several on the very core matter that has been raised. Has the rise of the citizen journalist and social influencer been made possible by what has been claimed as a lacking, shortcomings, not keeping up with the times, not evolving on the part of traditional media. What to your mind has created that gap that needed to be filled in the Guyana context? Do we have any contributions towards that? So if there's no contribution from the audience, I would like to put it to the panel. Uh, who would like to go on that? Mr. Johnson. Uh, all right. Sure, let me. Uh, we saw just now in the last two presentations is Precisely what I'm talking about. Um, you have a good friend here, Mikhail, saying that he, as a citizen journalist, has came about primarily because he felt that the mainstream media will, were all perhaps unconsciously called legitimate media, um, was not doing enough. But Raul, by calling the Guyana Press Association and, and mainstream media, legitimate media, it presumes that citizen journalism is illegitimate media. And therein you have that, that contestation. Now, what Raul is saying, however, is that there's a betrayal, not necessarily by citizen journalism, citizen journalists, but by the centers of power in alienating legitimate journalists in favor of citizen of a citizen journalism and, the, and and let me be frank the you were saying that mainstream media is, is aligned to to business big business and Ron is saying that you get exclusive interviews with Jaguar means that you align with power in each in each accusation, and this conflict is the there is the there is the accusation of that treason that I spoke spoke about. There's the treason, the clerk, and the treason, the city. And I think that that is what is the cause of conflict here. Now, it, it ties into why I said if it is that journalism, the theme is journalism is under digital siege. Who, ex who exists in the place being besieged and who's doing the besieging? Is it Raul or is it uh, thing? So those are the questions we have to negotiate. Uh, those are the things that we have to navigate until we come to a place, I believe, of um, synthesis in ensuring that the people receive credible, competent, fair journalism from whoever is presenting it. Thanks. So to drill down on that a little further, 
The scenario you alluded to, Mr. Johnson, yeah. on the global stage of the Arab Spring, uh, which was occasioned um, by a number of factors, uh, do you believe that this rise of this alternative form of reporting is driven by the public need for something fresh or is it responding to a need for the toppling of the hegemony as you put it uh, more more specifically where do we where do we balance the two to come up with a plausible recognition of this new space that has been exploited uh, see, there, there's been the whole thing is has to do with the deficit of trust you accept you consume information news from somebody you trust um, people realize that they can't realize they can't trust a media that is dependent on commercial interests what it is that they're dependent on advertising or, or the media is dependent on the fact that that the Jeff Bezos, for example, owns the Washington Post, or that somebody owns a media house, um, has various business interests. And we have that in Ghana. We have mainstream media houses that are aligned to economic interests. So you won't see a negative story on X, Y, or Z because of somebody friend, economic and class interest. So there's a deficit of trust. So when critic came about without advertising and without thing and, and he talking around and he talking like people, just as happened globally, there's been a tectonic shift of trust from mainstream to citizen reporting. The citizen who is now armed with this, technically the same powers of dissemination that the mainstream formerly had because the mainstream could have afforded newsprint. Now we don't need newsprint, you get Facebook. Um, so there's been a tecto tectonic shift, shift of trust. The, the question is, wherever there's trust, there is a capacity for betrayal of trust. Has somebody, a citizen reporter, who has risen in a very stellar fashion, can he now be accused of betrayal of trust? So, so that's the question. Thanks. Mr. Tony? Um, if I, um, before person go on, how many persons are in here from Linden? Show of hands. Show of hands. How many persons are in here from Linden? Linden is in the house. Anyone old enough to remember a certain person in this room had a character by the name of Rovin Doc? Anyone? Do you remember what Rovin Doc used to do? We used to do. Anyone, anyone that knows? No. <laughs> All right, so Dario McClellan, when he was at uh, NCN Linden, he developed a character by the name of, back then we didn't have social media. We had no social media, or that I know of. So he developed a character by the name of Rovin Doc, and this character goes around the community of Linden, and they highlight things that are happening. So he highlighted if there was an area of bushes, if there were bad roads, if the, if the river was affecting residents, he would really tell the stories of residents the way how they want to put them, using a little character that he developed called the Roving Doc. We didn't have social media back then. The entire Linden gravitated to it, so much so that when the Roving Doc is not on television, when he's supposed to be, it was an uproar. Something wrong with Dario, is he sick? Good. Fast forward, I was asked to join the newsroom by the principals of the newsroom in 2016. The newsroom principals wanted to bring about balancing two types of news. They wanted to give you the unconventional way of reporting, balancing it with the tenets of journalism and reporting the newsroom. So the principles of the newsroom wanted to do a couple of things. More importantly, one, not to tell your everyday story. 
about how many accidents we would have had, how many persons would have died from whatever sickness that were prevalent at the time or anything of this sort. They wanted to tell the stories of everyday individuals, the man selling sweetie in the corner, auntie, all the way down a region nine that gets up at four in the morning to walk umpteen miles to and fro to have her work done. The newsroom changed, they like it or not, the newsroom changed the way we looked at news over a couple of years in terms of television and online reporting. I say that to say, coming back to the question that Dario would have asked, if the luck brought about the likes of the Guyanese critics and others, I say no. I would admit maybe the lack of creativity in the way in which we present the news, be it print, online, or television. Telling raw stories, telling true stories. I do, the, I do sport. Everyone know me from, as a sport journalist. Some of the best stories that I would have done is telling the stories of poor athletes, telling their stories about the rise to fame from literally nothing. And I've seen many of those stories change their lives. I've seen people moving from a dam where they live with no water and electricity to a home. I've seen people where the parents had to walk the entire Linden just to raise funds for them to compete for Guyana, not knowing that they were poor, single parent, and I've seen their lives change entirely. The student is on scholarship. So maybe our, the media houses themselves would have played a role in bringing about the likes of the Guyanese crit critics and other persons have done an unconventional way of doing the news. So I would say I blame the media houses. Maybe our lack of creativity to change with time and to adapt to a society that want the news, but they also want it in variations, I should say. All right, so... Before, those... before, we, before we continue along the, the line of questioning, over the side, um, if I may. Hi. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm Derwin. I'm the online editor at the Guyana Chronicle. Um, the question relating to the trust um, that the population has in, you know, social media accounts that have large followings. We spend some amount of time asking questions about integrity and integrity in reporting as it relates to how information is shared on social media platforms. Traditional media houses have always operated with some bare, bare minimum standards. We are guided by ethics. We are guided by laws, we have trainings, and there are some times when we even change the way in which we do certain coverage. And we adopt new responsible ways to report on things like gender, things relating to suicide, things relating to uh, violence in particular. At one point in time with a newspaper, if it bleeds, it leads, and that no longer is the case. We have had to constantly redefine the way in which we report and this is from the print perspective. That print perspective and the broadcast perspective eventually transitioned into the online platform for those traditional media houses. We are now in a place where there is still some amount of a friction and a tension between what the population demands and what we are allowed to do. And it is that friction that has allowed for the prominence of these additional accounts to pop up and fill in that gap a gap where we can't even shred, because at the end of the day, it will subject us to not only lose our integrity, but it could land us very well in court, getting abused down by magistrates, even for how we report on certain matters, especially if these matters are in camera matters. We could be called out in different reports, human rights reports, etc., for publishing certain things related to persons who are otherwise protected under the law. And so we have to be mindful that despite the ways in which social media accounts have popped up and gained large followings and they do all manner of things, there are still some other very serious considerations that we take into, in, in, into in our, um, our overall reporting, which helps us to not only maintain our integrity, but also to protect our society and the people that we report on. And that is the ethical principle of do no harm. Dario, before, before you... Before you, you move on, um, Doreen is absolutely right. And just bring me back to the next point. 
when the Guyana Press Association holds training on matters of gender, on matters of suicide, and how we report on suicide, and how we report on a number of, of, of issues that would have legal implication. I know the Chronicle would know more about this because the Chronicle always gets his too. But, <laughs> but well, on a very serious note, though, when the Guyana Press Association put forward this training, one set of people turn up, the media houses. You don't see the social media influencer. You don't see the people parading with a, with, a, with a smartphone, calling themselves citizens, journalists. You don't see them at any of these training. Because we're not invited. And often time, and often time, and often time, we would spend countless time correcting their mistakes. Like, no, that, that is not how you report on, on, on suicide. That is not how you report on an issue. So when a media house mess up, in, in, in layman terms, when a media house mess up, the publisher or the editor in chief is the one that is dragged to court. So there are a lot of things that a media house can't do and can't say, as Darwin would have rightfully pointed out, because we're guided by a specific code, code rather, and held to a higher standard. So let's, let's expound on that a bit. Uh, our friend from the Chronicle there made some very interesting observations. So journalism, traditionally, has been guided by the rubric of the who, what, when, where, why, and how. Outside of that, you have the issues of credibility, of integrity, of rule of law, to whatever applicable law there is to govern the way the media operates. To what extent are we arguing that those who have taken the, the advent of social media or, and exploited that platform to fill a niche, a gap area, as we've heard, that would have arisen from lack of creativity, from mundaneness of the traditional process, and the roving duck character that Roll alluded to. That's, where, that's what it came from. So there was a recognition that the news had become very mundane, Matters were being reported on ad nauseum without any corrective action. And so that alternate character was invented with the addition or the injection of satire in the approach to journalism to make it a little more entertaining. And it worked. In London, the powers that be that could have responded to issues, all of the issues that were raised on in that context, uh, were addressed. 100% correct, uh, corrective action was taken throughout the entire period of that style of reporting. So, and this is about 10 years ago. It worked and it's now working again when, in the context of what we're seeing from many of our citizen reporters. To what extent are we arguing then that what we are seeing from our new age reporters, because many of our social uh, influencers have gone further, because we now have the break news coming out from the Guyanese critic, started out as a social commentator, social influencer with a platform, a huge following, but that has now transitioned into real news, the break news, or albeit in, in, in a variated fashion of how that rubric of who, what, when, where, why, and how is applied. So are we arguing that we're not seeing that rubric in that kind of reporting? Because those who have a, an appetite for immediacy, rawness, freshness, know here it is at your fingertip, may very well be recognizing the who, what, what when, where, why, and how in various forms coming out of that kind of reportage. So let's, let's discuss that. To what extent traditional media, if you're saying traditional media is being overrun and overthrown by this type of reportage, are you then arguing that those principles are not there? They're not present in this kind of approach? 
Yeah, we'll have to look at it on a case by case basis. But um, I will just use one example um, that, that happened recently, and many of us saw as well. Sometimes we have to allow our own systems that are set up within the country to work and to do its work. When it comes to putting certain information out into the public, there's a duty of care that should always, always take precedence. And this one might not sit well with the room, but I watched a domestic violence matter play out publicly recently. A matter that would have otherwise been kept in camera in a court was being investigated in the presence of a watching nation. And I find concern with that. So it's not to say I'm going to allow myself to just brandish everything and everybody one time, but it's for us to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis and pull out those instances where there was, in fact, a grave step away from what ought to have happened. And that is my opinion on these social media accounts with large followers. So we're going, to, we're going to come to the discussion about what needs to be done to bring accountability. That's, uh, that's, an, that's an ongoing conversation. What happens with social there. media as a space right now is something that it's not only us, we're not the only ones trying to figure this out. Because for Guyana, as far as I can remember, when it, came to, when it comes to social media, Facebook platforms and, and Twitter and so on, 2009 was when it exploded for many of us. And from 2009 onward, there has been an influx into these spaces. The companies themselves are surprised at the way in which they've grown. The governments for which those companies are located in are now trying to put legislation in place to control the way in which those companies handle different things. Community standards are being set by those companies instructed by Congress, US Congress, instructed by the EU Parliament, instructed by the UK Parliament, instructed by the Canadian and Australian Parliament. And so what you have now is a figuring out that happens not only on our part as it relates to how social media is used, but also on how they themselves operate internally. Facebook recently set up its board, um, its oversight board, which you know is even being questioned as to whether it actually has oversight, and a new real oversight board was created as a civil society body. So everybody's trying to figure this, figure this out. Yeah. What so I'm saying is the conversation hasn't ended. It's an ongoing conversation. So I won't uh, treat my opinions the final one, but it's just an observation. For someone who is a consumer of this type of social media reporting, that immediate, raw coverage of events and news, to what extent do you care about those principles, about adherence to the traditional pillars of journalism? Can I hear from someone who is an advent user of social media and you live on it in fact you prefer to have your information and news from it and through it to what extent do you care about those things so i care about those things because lies influence decisions and perceptions whether it's my friend my family or it's about my friend Ed Lane, if I see something negative about him, if it's a lie and I perpetrate it, shared by Derwin, then what I just did there, allegedly. Allegedly, <laughs> allegedly, is that I share something wrong about Ed because it was immediately shared to me by Derwin, a certain journalist. Allegedly. If the tables were turned and it was about me i would not want derwin to share it yes was because it's about ed i am happy i laugh and i share it with my friends and that those basic principles as a consumer i think if it's about your family or friend you quit to jump on the post and ask the person to take it down or you want to cancel this person that person so because you don't want the immediate and accurate information out about you and your family, it is untenable to accept that against any other human being on this planet. But against the 
the backdrop of the Internet of Things, that concept introduced by Professor Obadiah earlier today, where globally the appetite is there, like we see in Guyana, for that kind of information shared in that kind of way. To what extent then, again, uh, the concerns of the bastions of the court estate, particularly as argued so vehemently by the representative of the Guyana Press Association, to what extent do we need to pay attention to that in the context of the Internet of Things where it's a global phenomenon? Stacey, uh, others who are, who are very versed in the Internet of Things, social media, uh, to what extent can we really take those concerns of the traditional structure uh, seriously? If I might have an input here, okay. um, just not to go away too far from the statement made about the domestic violence um, story being played out. Uh, firstly, I wear many hats, and as you said, I have Daybreak News, which is a formal news entity and we have applied to the Guyana Press Association and confirmed to their rules. I'm just a publisher there and I'm guided by the same constitution that guides the Guyana Press Association. So I have a unique understanding of all that goes on. So this, this that is happening here really happens personally with me. I have to be asking myself, how do you make sure you're in the border of what is the norm, and should I stay on that border while being the Guyanese critic and the publisher of um, Guyanese critic where I have free reign and the publisher of Daybreak News where I'm guided and stay guided. If you look at Daybreak News, you realize the, the news comes out late like everybody else because it has to go through an editor, it's a process, and I have nothing to do with how that story is fashioned. Unfortunately, that is not the same in a lot of media entities, because I worked at Kaicho News. And who works at Kaicho News know there's a four o'clock meeting where the news is fashioned by Glenn Lal. Simple, I work there, right? That is my experience. The news is fashioned. If the oil news doesn't sound enough to involve Barrett Jagdew, if the news doesn't make it sound like Barajagdu owns the Marriott or the Barbies Bridge, I kid you not, Glenn Lal convinces everybody there that this is how you don't understand this thing. No empirical evidence, but that's how it works. Now, to the issue of um, the story that actually came out on Big Smith News of the domestic violence case. Um, My, it's Big Smith News Watch. Y'all keep breaking this thing off. Big Smith News Watch. Sorry, I apologize. Right? So what happened there? I looked at um, Big Smith News Watch. We all looked at it. And the victim said her side of the story. The accuser, the victim's brother, as a matter of fact... I, I, I think we should avoid the details. Let's avoid the details of the story, please. Just, the story is before the board, you know. Excuse me. Just, just, so, just so we keep the conversation on track, um, because given the details, uh, could take it for the... No, it's not na no names are being caused. It's, but I'm saying, I received a call from the other side, and I had to make a decision. I would want to think the other side at the time assumed that they would have come, fashioned the story, and explained, you know, their side of it. I showed what the instance was, which all Guyanese could have made a decision because there was a video out there. And then I asked for an explanation. What happened thereafter was a national debate on social media that persons in prominent places showed their true colors. 
there was something that transpired that could not add up to anything else than abuse. And you had people on their posts explaining it. I myself there, standing, doing an interview, asking for an explanation and wondering, how do you explain this? Now again, I had to make a call. One of the things happened there, nobody realized, I, I think my brother is looking at it from that perspective, is it never happened before where the accuser had an opportunity to speak. It happens in camera. But the truth was told. Everybody saw, and for the first time, a discussion of abuse on a level that reached every home. Child, man, woman, and child had a discussion. And we saw for the first time what people thought about abuse, how they were treating abuse. So that was the reason for my decision in following up on the story. But, so Dario, if I may. I've, 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 been, I've been advised that we have about Dario, 10 minutes I... remaining. One second. About 10 Dario, minutes remaining. Me. Oh, Dario, this, one... that, no, that matter is before the court, so I don't believe that we should be going too deep with it. It's that, that's why I'm moving on. I'm Good. moving on. I've been advised that we have about 10 minutes remaining. There are some critical issues that need to be raised to be able to wrap this entire conversation into some form, form and function that we can take away. And so before we get there, I want now to ask one of the students, you the young minds being influenced by both traditional media and new media, social media. You've heard the arguments about the tenants of traditional media that need to be safeguarded because of global standards, because of uh, those, the rubric that is involved, because of rule of law and all of that. You've heard the arguments about the need to fill that gap, that appetite for immediacy and rawness and all that. What is your take on how you are influenced by these arguments and where you see it going. Can we hear from one of the students? One of the students, please. Am I allowed to give an opinion at the back, the opposite side? Student of Communication Studies. Sure, you're a student. Personally, I think it is not an issue from a young person perspective as to the rise of social media, so much to say. To me, it is the issue of lawlessness, sensationalism, and misinformation. That, to me, is what we need to fix with this rise of social media and uh, citizens, reporters, and citizen journalists, whatever you call them, for, for which I think it's two different thing entirely. To call them citizens journalists is a mistake, uh, firstly for me. Um, I think they're reporters. Um, so if we can find means to control the sensationalism that comes out from it, because that makes it lawless to me. The news needs to be fresh. The news, the news needs to evolve where it comes to people in, in an instantaneous fashion, et cetera, and the, 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 the medium of social media brings that. But when it inculcates personalities and things that really and truly uh, traditionally um, doesn't fit into the criteria of being news, I think we need to cut it. That's all I have to say. Um, ha da Dario, over here. Stacy. Yeah, if I could just add to um, what uh, the young man just said. Um, I believe we always had citizen journalists, even prior to the rise of social media. Um, Sharma, we had persons. It's just that social media has now allowed 
a wider coverage. It has, a wide, it has allowed a wider platform or more viewership, but we always had citizen journalists. That being said, I think that is why we need to find some sort of balance because as somebody who's considered an influencer myself, with a platform that only shares positive content, it can be done. Um, what I have found is that there are some persons who have influence or who are trying to get influence um, that are using selective stories just for hits or to get more influence. And I think that's another issue that needs to be considered. And though, that's why they're, you know, as social media uh, influencers increase and as social media reporting increases, we do have to put certain things in place the same way traditional journalism have certain criteria, they have to follow conscience, integrity, and all of that. Because I have personally seen this, and I'm sure other people have too, with persons just reporting select stories or spinning it a certain way to get hits or to get likes. And that's another thing social media has done. Thank so, you, Ceci. Yes. Thank you, thank you Ceci. One moment. Um, our, us ending very quickly is very critical given what needs to happen in these facilities uh, momentarily. Uh, we have the visit of a foreign head of state planned for tomorrow, and these facilities will have to be secured for security reasons very shortly. And so I want to pose this as the final question for which I'm going to ask for you to offer your closing remarks in the context of that question. So social reporters, social influencers will continue whether we like it or not. That rise will continue. Uh, our media landscape, our platforms for information will continue to expand with that kind of interjection of how information is disseminated. We're hearing from the social operatives that there's need for local standard, for legitimacy. We're hearing from the Ghana Press Association, the bastions of the Fourth Estate in the Ghana context that unless conformity to traditional norms are had in that process, then the issue of legitimizing the social platforms and social operatives become a matter of contention or continues to be a matter of contention. What needs to happen for that legitimacy to take place on the social side what, needs, what adjustments need to be made by the bastions of the fourth estate to accommodate that legitimacy? Um, basically, well, there are cyber laws out there. Um, again, I, as a social media influencer myself, I do believe that we have a personal responsibility to think before we act and think before we put out certain information. That's not to say I'm not an advocate for uh, creative freedom, but whatever we do as a human being, it comes with a responsibility, not to harm, not to cause damage. And yes, I agree, news has to be shared, information has to be shared in a raw fashion, but we should still dive in, you know, make it our duty and responsibility to, delve a little deeper into those stories and and you know the way um big smith did with his story when he did it he did it in a in a fashion that was respectful of victim moving on from that so i think that's one of the things we need to be cognizant as influencers more education needs to happen more forums like this where influencers are involved in the conversation and discourse so that, that's my take on it. We need to be more involved in uh, training sessions, in um, conversations, dealing with media, not only traditional media operatives anymore. Yeah. Um, the question, there are two things. One, as you said, the, the toothpaste is out of the tube. There's, there isn't going to be any going back with regard to the role of citizen journalists 
and they, they are journalists. There are two types. There are two aspects of media reporting. There's reporting and there's commentary. And people comment, and hence they are citizen journalists in that broad sense. That is going to go back. Um, and it, but the reason that it isn't going to go backward is very simple. So the end, the big picture is, is that it generates activity, it generates eyes, and the people who own the media, Twitter, Facebook, etc., they make money off of you. And the more you are, the more you, the eyes on what is generated, the content is generated. That's why they keep putting more and more power into the individual's hands. So the more and more content that is generated, uh, it's better for them, it's more money they make. Um, so you don't, you're not really citizen journalist in that sense, in the sense that the person who owns the medium is the person who is really, who really has the power. If Facebook shuts down um, from Guyana, the break news is severely impacted. Now, for our purposes, um, the question of legitimacy, etc., is a very fluid one. Not because somebody endorses something that makes it legitimate. The Guyana Press, um, Guyana Press Association is not legitimate because they have been around since 1945, however. What they do in regard to keeping up the certain principles and serving a certain function in service to the people, that is what defines legitimacy. And the same exists for people like Critic. Was it, uh, the best we can do is forums exactly like this, in which everybody is brought to the table, and there's dialogue, and there's discussion, and there's a free and frank airing of perspectives and hearts and, and slights. And then going forward, hopefully there's some sort of cohesive action that incorporates everybody around clearly published principles that are not tucked away somewhere. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Rodriguez? I think the main fact that we're here and having this discussion, um, this should be the last discussion as to where uh, social media influencers or social media um, commentators or reporters stand in media. We are here, we are here to stay, and it seems that we are the future. What is integral is like everything else that comes and has been, um, you know, birthed to a need or a demand is guidance. There are some um, cybercrime laws which I think need to be reviewed and most likely there would have to be a body that guides these persons. But in light of the fact um, how far reaching this is and the involvement of the amount of people on uh, unlike um, conventional media a tv station you could find them um you know newspapers you know where they are they're registered um the break news is registered you could find the the editor or myself uh how do you find someone operating from a phone and just popped up so i would want to think the cyber crime laws would have to take or, or some cyber laws, not necessarily crime, but conduct, more of a conduct. Because um, as the young man would have said earlier, it is how it's seen and how it's put forward, sometimes lewd, uh, whatever. Um, so there might have to be cyber laws that guide influencers and a process um, that educates them also because it's here and as we all are aware is very much in need of guidance thank you very much mr rogers thank you so um i i kind of sense here as though um that there seem to be some degree of finger pointing only when it comes to sensationalism only to the social media influencer and um, and the, the social media influencer. I want to 
I want to say that that is not so. We have also had, and I want to make sure that I, that I put it out there that I've been part of the traditional media in this country for 20 something years. I see my mentor and um, former supervisor, Michelle Abraham Ali is here, so she can testify to that. Um, I've been in the media. I've all, I'm also considered a social media influencer, but I've seen people who are journalists who are supposed to uphold the constitution and the, and the morals and the ethics of journalism, sensationalizing stories. I sat in uh, one time looking at the press conference of Aubrey Norton and I heard, and I know a few journalists will be upset with me here, and I heard um, Adam Harris referring to Aubrey Norton as the comrade leader in a press conference. Is he a journalist or is he a, a you know, <laughs> was he there as a journalist or, or politician? So you could, you, I'm, I'm saying all of these things to say that while we want to point fingers on the other social media influencers as the persons who step outside of the journalism ethics, they are journalists in Guyana who sometimes they go and they do politics when they're supposed to be doing journalism and sometimes they show us the sensationalized stories. So we've got to also work from the inside. Uh, Ron, I'm not here, I'm not attempting to knock you, but I left this country and started um, uh, quite a few years ago. And the same president of the Guyana uh, Press Association is still the same president. And we're talking about constitution and, and, and um, sticking to, to the rules and stuff like that. And they themselves kind of stick to the rules of what is supposed to be, or the guidance of their constitution. So there are lots of things that need to be fixed there. And let us not only point our fingers to the people who are the social media influencers, but we've got to also take a deep look inside of the journalism uh, field. And uh, we've got some work to do there. Thank you very much. Thanks. Mr. Tony. Thanks, Dario. I think one of the biggest misconception or mistake made today is our failure to really identify or differentiate the difference between social media influencer and social commentators. I think Rua would have pointed out to that. Stacey is, a social, is, uh, in, is an influencer. I think we all could agree that Visit Guyana would have brought a unique way of putting forward our country as a, a pristine destination within the world. And I must comment her on this because I can remember when I traveled to the UAE with a mixed martial arts team, she wanted to share information about um, the first Guyanese team to compete at an international mixed martial arts event. And she contacted me for information because she was totally ignorant of mixed martial arts and the people on the team. So she said, look, since you're there, could you share photos with me? Could you give inf information? She is an influencer through and through. So I think we, we, we mix up influencers by commentators. The Guyanese cricket is a commentator. O.C. Rogers is a commentator. Politics is what he commentates on. So we can't bring the two together in the same space and judge both of them. So one of the things that, that's one of, the, one of our mistakes here today by putting the two together. And I think when, why we bump in heads as it relates to the the Guyana Press Association and the conventional media is social commentators and the media. There are always going to be a role for social commentators, but it would never be a guideline set out by no government around the world that could govern a social commentator. However, we have laws like our cybercrime laws. We, there, are, are, you could, there are defamation cases you could take against them, but there would never be nothing that we could put in place to really confront or to really deal with social commentators. As Stacey would have rightfully pointed out, social commentators pick out a particular issue and dive into that. The conventional media houses, using the various tenets of journalism, we cover every single aspect of the news, from sport right down. And if time permits, if I could share, a couple of days ago, I was talking on social media about the post. Someone cropped a result from a football game with Guyana versus Mexico. Mexico defeated Guyana 15 goals to nil. 
and shared it on social media, which happens to be a popular, I would want to say, influencer. And how it was shared is a lot for Guyana being beaten, the government of Guyana not doing enough, the Football Federation not doing enough, blah, 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 blah. And parents of not knowing that it was another 17 girls football team, also not knowing that they were playing in the knockout stage of the under 17 uh, Women's World Cup. Historically, Guyana would have never participated at the under 17 knockout stage. Those young ladies, they had to play to qualify to be there, playing against the defending champions of the tournament as well, being Mexico. So they were beaten 15 goals to nil. No shame in that. Until I, it is not until I was stabbed in that pose by parents of those young ladies and I explained in detail that this was young girls and they're being harassed on social media, then it was deleted and an apology was given. Brings me to the point of saying we have social commentators that focus on an issue to fit their agenda. In OC's case, his agenda is politics. In Guyanese critics case, sometimes I'm lost as to what his agenda is. But the fact is, they focus on, an, on a particular agenda. So we made a mistake in mixing social media influencers and, and, and the ramblers on social media in this discussion. And I say that the Guyana Press Association is open to having everyone involved in training so they could abide by the guidelines that all other journalists like myself and us in the room here are guided by. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tony, and we appreciate the participation of the Guyana Press Association throughout uh, these discussions. Let me now call on a student from the Christianburg Wisma Secondary School, an upper sixth form student, Norian King, to do a quick uh, vote of thanks to you, the panelists, in social media language. <laughs> You, you can use the microphone up there. Thank you. Use the one with the mics there. <laughs> Let me see. Oh, no. <laughs> Good afternoon, Minister McCoy, other ministers in attendance, members of the panel, media representatives, and all others in attendance today. My name is Narian King. I am a current upper six student at the Christian Bergwism Secondary School. If your passion is founded in the communication field, use your enthusiasm to practice and never forget your integrity. Remember, with freedom comes responsibility. Check your sources for reliability and validity. I extend gratitude to Mr. Kwame McCoy, Mr. Michael Gordon, and all others associated in the planning and executing of such an intriguing and educational World Press Freedom Day Conference 2022. Delegates in attendance, we thank you for your time and efforts over the two day over this two day period. Thank you. Thank you very much. And to bring a quick wrap. To today's proceedings, uh, let me invite now the Director of Public Affairs, Mr. Michael Gordon. Thank you, Mr. Moderator of the final symposium, the fourth and final symposium. Uh, I hope you don't leave just yet because there is one more goodie we have for you at the registration desk. Uh, permit me to lead you in applause of yourselves for participating and staying true to the end of a very intriguing discussion, day of discussion. The final panel, to my mind, is a microcosm of the discussions and the challenges we face in media today. Having said that, one of the most common utterances or declarations made over the two days of deliberations among media, public relations, communication specialists, is the whole notion for the need of conversation. I believe this conference, this inaugural World Press Freedom Day conference and symposium 
acts as a catalyst for us to examine and establish a framework among all stakeholders to have that national conversation as it relates to one common good, the development, clarification, and also uh, the advancement of the overarching umbrella of mass communication in Guyana. It's, in that note, it's on that note, in my capacity as Director of Public Affairs in the Office of the Prime Minister, I am aware that the Department of Public Affairs, as an arm of the government of Guyana, is committed to, we are committed to even initiating this conversation, and thus the reason we are here today. I would like to call, therefore, on the Guyana Press Association, the University of Guyana, journalists, and also marketing companies and corporations, because there is a direct correlation between all that we discussed over the past two days and the whole notion of marketing and every subsector covered under the overarching umbrella of mass communications. So the conflict between you and that conversation covers a, a multiplicity of, of topics, should cover. And I challenge anyone and all here today to play their part in the, in the continuation. This conference initiated the conversation. Play your part in the continuation of the discussions on the conflict between new media and legacy media. Legacy media meaning radio, television, and newspaper. The media landscape as a whole. The trajectory of the media landscape as a whole. The role of media ultimately the subject of the ultimately the gist of, of this conference and symposium, the role of the media in the developmental agenda of, of this beloved country we call Guyana. There is a role for everyone, and everyone has to be embraced in this process. The future of print, that too is to be considered. And ultimately, that marketplace referred to as media the marketplace from a standpoint of who is accepted and who isn't, how one is accepted and how one isn't, how one is included and one isn't, the economics of the business of media. These are all issues we need to cover in this conversation which, we be, which began today. Th there were many comments today on the role of new media, how new media should be used, the orthodox or unorthodox manner in which new media is used. And I believe there is a role for every medium. There is a role for every medium. And when one examines the, the science behind marketing, for example, one would consider and understand that marketing targets medium based on a number of considerations, which includes the demographics. And demographic is very important. I urge us to continue this conversation, not, on, not from an acrimonious standpoint, but from a strategic point, standpoint, which ensures the strategic development, well-being, and, and sustained manner with, in which the, the media operates is captured. It is against that backdrop that all media constitute an important accountability, and me, accountability mechanism. It raises the important issues, corruption, for example, that might otherwise be never be publicly debated or addressed. The media also has an important role in stimulating governments to take action on social and social policy. That is an aspect of the role of the media in the developmental agenda. One, let us not, let us disabuse our minds that there is no role for media and journalism 
in a national developmental trajectory there is. The fourth estate holds governments accountable to ensure policies and programs are implemented that covers every demographic. demographic. The media also exposed problems that need to be addressed, for example, poor living conditions and lack of access. The media also exposes and, and highlights progress made, absolutely. It isn't just the role of a Department of Public Information to report on develop, development and positive stories in our society. Mass media and other forms of communication technology have an enormous influence in helping to shape public opinion. Everything we do, whether it be a product of marketing, content, whether it be social media or legacy media, you're referring to it as, as newspaper, television, and radio. Everything you do, your product is put into the arena referred to as the court of public opinion and the public judge. There is a role for everyone. These are all, in the, all forms of media are important sources of basic information about other people, other places, and this can itself help to engender understanding if presented in a fair, even-handed, and non-inflammatory way. It is on this note I urge us, I plead, I plead, let this conversation continue, all stakeholders. It is in the interest, not only of the development of the media, but it's in the interest of the development of our country. And the past two days of deliberations did nothing but highlight and bring to the fore even greater and even greater need for this to be pursued. It is on this note that I thank you again for participating in the proceedings. I could not close, however, without mentoring some of the partners who came on board with us uh, to ensure that this conference and symposium became a success. And I'm referring to the, the Guyana Press Association. We thank you dearly for the role you played in these discussions. I thank the United Nations Guyana office. They, they too played a significant role in these discussions. And of course, we would like to thank all the other partners in terms of those who provided sponsorship to ensure that we remain comfortable and we have got an opportunity to focus on the discussions at hand. So thank you to Optic Vision Care, Banks DIH Limited, The Single Trading Limited, Impressions, Star Party Rentals, The Guyana Telephone and Telegraph Company, Digicel, Maggie's Catering, and Windjammer Catering. Yes, of course, when I mention. <laughs> On this note, I hereby bring a close to the conference, and we'd like to see you in World Press Freedom Day Conference and Symposium 2023. I thank you. <laughs> Just one housekeeping matter before you go. Please check with the registration desk for one final gift, compliments of one of our sponsors.